Hello and welcome to this last panel discussion of the Kultursymposium Weimar. This discussion is dedicated to the magical phenomenon that touches each and every one of us and has the power to radically change things. Love. We are witnessing interesting developments these days. In our global metropolises, there are living more and more single people. Yet at the same time, the desire for connection and belonging seems stronger than ever. And the diversity of modern relationships gets bigger from arranged marriages to romantic couples, to same-sex marriages, polyamorous configurations, and casual hookups. What patterns can be discerned here? Are we only experiencing new forms of the same old principles? Or are traditional role models and relationship models slowly or quickly losing their significance? To discuss how our notions of love, partnership, and sexuality differ from those of our parents and grandparents, I welcome three panelists for this evening. I welcome matchmaker Sima Tapadia, whom you might know from the Netflix show Indian Matchmaking. Welcome, Sima. It's great to have you with us. Hello. We welcome sex therapist Ruth Westheimer, whom you might know from the documentary, Ask Dr. Ruth. And I very much uh, welcome a poet and best-selling author, JJ Bola, who recently published the book, Mask of Masculinity Redefined. Hi. Welcome again. Great to have you with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. JJ. Thank you so JJ, if I may start with you. In our preparatory talk, you mentioned that in many cases, we have difficulties talking about love and sexuality in intergenerational constellations. Like it's way easier uh, to discuss these topics with people of your own age than for example, with your parents or grandparents. And if I'm not mistaken, we now have three generations here on the panel. So is that a good first step? <laughs> I think it is a good first step to have so many uh, generations in especially on this panel because we all come from a very unique set of circumstances and experiences cultures knowledge backgrounds that inform the way that we see the world and the way that we form our connections the way that we understand love and the way that we develop relationships as well and I think that it's incredibly important for us to have those cross-generational conversations because we can learn not to make the same mistakes that was made before. We can learn to what, what to improve upon and then we can learn also what to perhaps change. And I think that love sometimes is kind of spoken about really romantically as if we're all supposed to know what we're doing, right? As if we're just supposed to feel everything and that you're just going to understand and know exactly what to do when you meet the one but actually in for any of us who've been in relationships like we understand that it's a lot more complicated than that it's a learning process we have one expert here for such processes um Sima you work as a marriage consultant and matchmaker since 2005 so for many many years you have arranged marriages um, you have a lot of experience, um, you have witnessed what people need, uh, what they ask for. Um, how has this role of a matchmaker changed in, during this time span that you have been working as a matchmaker? Uh, during, I mean, in so many years, they were love marriages also, and they are arranged marriages also. So after my show, now the youngsters have opted for more for arranged marriage. The reason is that in arranged marriages, they give their all criteria and their preferences. And that is fulfilled. Like I, my job is to fulfill what their criteria and preferences are there. So people, they are opting more for arranged marriages. Like what they want in that the way, what type of girl boy they want, what type of character they want, what type of studies they want. Everything it is written in a menu, like 
we want this 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 and then i fulfill them i cater them i work for them that's my duty so many people now they are opting again for arranged marriages and it is the old tradition of india arranged marriages are the old tradition of india and now after releasing my show indian matchmaking on netflix people have now now again they are opting that we want to do arranged marriage because all their criteria and preferences are fulfilled in that that's interesting because i think you said it's um 60% is the uh a percentage of arranged marriages in india and you're saying that this even got up after the show right yeah, yeah. because of these after clear the, criteria after the show the world is again they want to do arranged marriages that way dr ruth can yes. i turn to you yes hi there you, you hi you have been an advocate for a better and healthier sex life uh, for everyone for more than 40 years. Uh, you've both hosted and appeared in numerous uh, radio and TV programs. You have been teaching at several universities uh, and you are the author of 46 books, right? If I'm uh, getting that right. Um, so if you hear uh, what Seema just said, that arranged marriages are successful because people have clear criteria that the other party then can respond to. Do you think that this works? Does this correspond to your experiences working with these criteria? Well, it does depend because there are groups of people where arranged marriages, like you discussed just now, um, has been part of their tradition and has been part of the familiar way of looking for a partner for your uh, daughter or for your son. So that's one way. The other way, some young people do not want to have their parents uh, involved. Um, maybe they would be more willing to involve um, a therapist or a professional. Uh, in, in today's world, where there is so much talk about loneliness and about the difficulty finding a partner for life, I'm all for any help that could be provided if people are very realistic, if they don't expect that um, a suitor comes on a white horse and is wealthy and is a prince so that the reality, but I'm all for people, the parents, the aunts and uncles, television programs uh, for trying uh, to get people together of all ages in order to combat that loneliness that has been strengthened with this epidemic. And my advice is to say, Thank God we are alive. Thank God we are at the end of this terrible uh, time. Now let's look ahead with hope and with the resolve of finding a partner uh, for life. As everybody knows, I'm very old fashioned and a square. I'm now 93 years old. I still am working every single day, but I'm also very realistic. Yes, we have to help people to find a partner, but we also have to be realistic of saying uh, they are not going to come with a big sack of gold coins and they are not going to come with all of the attributes that you want in a partner. Mm -hmm. and but I even look on television with all of my experience I know you cannot do therapy therapy you can only do in a place in a room in a place where you can see that other person however what you can do is use the media like what we are doing right now mm -hmm. to discuss the issues 
and to make sure that people make the resolve, if they listen to us go to house now, to make a resolve that life will be better, but realistic. Mm -hmm. JJ mentioned at the beginning that we might not necessarily know how to formulate what we need and what we want in relations and love, right? You have worked as a yes. sex therapist for 40 years. What is the most important yes. lesson? How do you teach people or how to, do you get people to this point that they can actually formulate what they need? I think that the most important point is to know what you need, which is not easy. But if, for example, if a couple says that they, uh, he is a premature ejaculator, he ejaculates faster than he wants to, or she does not, can't have an orgasm uh, for many reasons. Uh, some of them are that women, sometimes it takes a longer time for foreplay. It takes a longer time to be sexually aroused. And some women all over the world give up because they say, oh, it's not going to happen, maybe next time. My advice, never to give up. Make sure that you say to yourself, this is important. This is what I need for sexual satisfaction. That partner has to be taught. Maybe uh, the woman has to masturbate maybe even use a vibrator in order to be up on the point where she can be satisfied. And here is something very important for the Weimar Institute, the Goethe Institute at Weimar, very important. Dr. Ruth Westheimer, me, says that Sigmund Freud, this famous psychiatrist, Sigmund Freud should have taken the lesson with me because he was sexually ignorant. He said that any woman who needs clitoral stimulation in order to have an orgasm is an immature woman. Nonsense, loud and clear Goethe Institute. Nonsense, every, every woman, the clitoris is part of that sexual response. And he did us a tremendous disservice because women very often didn't help themselves by masturbating or didn't let their partners touch their clitoris because they're waiting for that, um, uh, for that uh, uh, orgasm, vaginal orgasm. So what my function was all of these years is to make sure that people are sexually literate that women and men know not to look for the G-spot, that we have no scientifically validated data that there is such a G-spot. Cosmopolitan uh, magazine did a wonderful survey, not scientifically validated, but a wonderful survey a few months ago by saying there is no such thing as a G-spot. I subscribe to that, that until um, university until a research institute would prove otherwise loud and clear Goethe Institute tell everybody there is no such thing as a G-spot stop looking for it make sure that you get involved in a sexual encounter with somebody that you really are interested in not just somebody but where you say to yourself, okay, I have to have sex. No such thing. Somebody, mm -hmm. somebody yeah. interested in. Thank you so much for this very clear message. I think Dr. Ruth inviting people to masturbate at the Kultursymposium Weimar. Please, 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 please. Never to masturbate with that screen on. <laughs> people are doing their jobs that way. <coughs> True. Go ahead. Can I come back to Sima with this? Um, Sima, we have talked about the criteria. Um, sexuality is usually not one of the criteria, right? That your uh, clients ask for. Um, we have seen in the Netflix series that they mostly ask for physical appearance, right? For um, aspects of social status, of 
professional background, of leisure, interests, etc. With all these criteria, how have they changed during the course of your career? Can you see that with the change of generations, also these criteria and expectations change? Very good question. What I do see uh, Dr. Rus Sorry, it's a, it's a question to Seema because she works as a matchmaker. So, thank you. Yeah. Joanna, it's a very good question. Like the times have changed now. Before people used to give importance to other things, like to the beauty and many other things. But now in the latest generation, the youngsters have changed their thoughts. They give more importance to the character, number one. The character is very important. Number two, intelligence. That their studies, their knowledge, their exposure in the outer world. And third, professional success. And beauty and those uh, looks are also important. But these three things, character, intelligent, and professional success. These three things, the youngsters, the present generation, they give more importance. So in these last 20 years, I have seen the change that people, the youngsters give importance to all these things. Then after that, the beauty comes, but this knowledge, brains, character, and intelligence, and professional success, these are the important things youngsters give importance. JJ, if you hear this talking about marriage, um, I mean, marriage is a very specific relationship form, right? And a lot of social expectations are tied to it. Um, you, in your latest book, you have talked about masculinity and how masculinity is also a performance that men are socially conditioned into. So again, here we have a topic uh, or an area that is full of social expectations, right? You argue that due to the technological developments, the younger generation is exposed to very toxic masculine ideals at a much faster rate than previous generations. What does this mean for the social conversations that we need to lead? So well, what this means, I think, for example, if we look at how young people are exposed to indecent pictures, um, sending nudes there's a lot of pressure on even at the teenage level young people send sending um, naked images to each other um, young people that are watching and viewing pornography for example at an age where they're not of adult age yet and these are really influencing the way that young people form their relationships and their expectations that they have within those relationships as well And then if you want to factor that in, in terms of like how young people, how so many young people, you know, meet each other in terms of like the platforms that we use. So like dating platforms such as Tinder, Hinge and so forth, sending these indecent images, these non-consensual images, uh, kind of it happens almost before you even get to know what the favorite, the person's favorite color is, you know, and and it, it's, it's, it's kind of like there's no real grounds of like safety um whereas like if you think about what sending an image like that was perhaps 20 years ago it wouldn't come on your phone it probably would come in a letter you know and and that would perhaps be seen as more romantic and so i think that in this accelerating times like we are exposed to especially young boys um more toxic expectations that a young boy there's a lot more pressure in terms of like how much money they have to make um what kind of like material goods or material materialistic items that they have whether they drive a car whether they have this job high ranking job etc all of these things and i think that in some ways that links back to quite a traditional like male role expectation within the patriarchal system but also we know that the current structure of society doesn't really operate in that way there's a equal access to education and you know jobs employment in ways that doesn't reflect the traditional setup in terms of like you know relationships and i am obviously talking more so about male female or heterosexual relationships in this example but i think that those kind of expectations are pervasive throughout and that sets us sets us up with the question is 
people, a lot of young people don't really know what roles to fulfill, you know, and so they double down on quite toxic expectations, thinking that it's the norm, and that can be very problematic. And how can we redefine masculinity, as you're suggesting? Well, for me, I think it's about two things, really. And I think the first thing is that we have to get rid of the gender binary. We have to get rid of the ideas that as a boy or a man, you're like this and you have to behave like this or you have to do this and so forth and so forth. And as a girl or a woman that you have to uh, act like this and be like this and behave like this. I think that creates a false sense of identity. It creates a false sense of entitlement and it creates toxic expectations amongst each other. And I think that the main thing that we really have to focus on is allowing us as human beings to be free in who we are to get to know ourselves. And like Seema was saying, you know, you know what you're looking for, right? In terms of whether someone of intelligence, of character and so forth. But also you have to know who you are when you step into a relationship so that you can kind of create the environment that's going to be helpful. Because if we don't have the same kind of structures, you know, that like 50, 30, 40 years ago, there was a lot more, um, perhaps judgment about whether or not you did get married or whether or not you had children or whether or not you know you decided to stay single or whether you got divorced now those kind of judgments aren't the same so I think it's really important that when we make these decisions um, that we can actually enter it in the fullness of who we are and we can be free in these relationships. Thank you very much for this. Uh, Dr. Ruth Yes, um, I hope you heard what uh, JJ said. He was also talking about the changing gender roles and how the expectations change and how it's important to first discover who you are yourself before you can actually enter a relationship. Right. So I have said all of it, these years that we do not know the etiology, which means the reason for homosexuality and I have said all of these years that uh, we need more research, but respect is not debatable. And that I think is very good for our discussion here, that every human being has the right to uh, be respected. And we as society, and especially people like all of us here, and the Goethe Institute have an obligation to make sure that we make that point about what we know and what we don't know, and that we do have to have more sexual literacy, that people have to be more knowledgeable about how to be satisfied and how to satisfy uh, their partner. Luckily, that we have plenty of books available. Luckily, we have these discussions, like today on the Goethe House, that sex is not anymore something to be kind of quiet, quiet. And um, the contrary, that the, the issue of being sexually literate and to know what one needs and what a partner needs is crucial. It's not the all in a relationship. There are many other components of uh, the relationship, uh, like really liking each other. If you want to build a relationship, being interested in what the other person does and thinks and feels, and at the same time, being willing to uh, give from yourself of um, what, what, what you need in a relationship. Mm -hmm. Very important for right now, after this terrible time of loneliness, mm -hmm. to make that step to be connected to one other person. And when I say connected to one other person, I, I mean uh, uh, homosexual, not homosexual, anybody. Just, just to combat this feeling of loneliness 
is very important. Mm -hmm. You just referred to homosexuality. And I think you also mean that relationships are getting more diverse or maybe the diversity is just more visible. And we have a lot of different forms of people coming together, entering intimate relationships or love relationships. Yeah. I'll give In, you a good and example. You, get, you, you still get questions, Dr. Ruth, right? Until now, yeah. people asking for your advice. So can you see that there is a development in this regard that the questions also get more diverse and yes. can you realize these changing gender roles yeah absolutely i tell you what what i can see is for example some years ago i would not have had older people asking about orgasms or asking about what to do to make their sex lives more varied or more uh, more interesting Things have changed, there is no question. It is not a shame anymore for older people to ask, um, for example, I give the advice that older people to have sex in the mornings when the testosterone level is highest, when it's easier for him to have an erection. And it's not true that women don't want to have sex in the morning after a good night's sleep, I tell them, get up, have a small breakfast, go back into bed. And you have to be knowledgeable, you have to, for women, to use a lubricant because there is less lubrication in the vagina as aging. So what we do know is that more information is certainly available across countries, on Zooms, like what we are doing with the Goethe House, and we have to use it. So it is definitely important. It is not a shame to be interested in issues of sexuality. Sima, um, Dr. Ruth just mentioned also how important respect is in relationships. Um, I remember from our talk um, that you also said, I mean, love, or a relationship is a give and take thing, right? So both people have to give in. Uh, it's again to Seema, the question. Um, so what, from your experience and from your, um, uh, in your opinion, what is the key to a happy relationship? Uh, actually, uh, I give a one sentence line that marriage means compromise and adjustment, number one. Second thing is give and take relationship, love and respect, and we have to be flexible. These are the four keys for a happy married life. I just give an example that when we are at the airport and when the flight is late, what do we do? We just sit, have coffee, have something, talk, because we are doing their adjustment. So the same thing, if we apply in our in a married life, a little compromise, a little adjustment, flexible, and give respect. Give and take relationship is very important. And when mm -hmm. we follow these certain four keys, then the marriage goes smoothly and the couple is happy. Mm -hmm. So these four or five things, I always suggest all my clients that just be a little compromise, just compromise and be a little flexible. Then everything goes smoothly. You have also accompanied your own daughter, right, into an arranged marriage. So she, you helped her to find a suitable uh, marriage partner. What do you particularly remember from this search, from this experience? My daughter and son-in-law are very happy because they have a very good relationship of love and respect. They are compatible. They're, they matches the chemistry, the wavelength. And both are very happy because give and take relationship is there. They understand each other very well. They balance their personal life and individual life and professional life. So I advise all the youngsters in today's world that you balance your personal life also and everybody is working so you balance your professional life. Then the life will go smoothly. So my son-in-law and daughter, they are very happy because they follow this thing. They have a daughter. Tomorrow is a birthday, a two-year granddaughter I have. And they follow these things and they both are very happy. 
So I advise everybody that you, ha you have to balance your professional and personal life. Then only the life goes smooth and happy. JJ, um, mm -hmm. we talk about arranged marriage. And of course, this is one way of entering into the agreement of marriage and one way of entering into a relationship. Um, however, there are many diverse ways, um, not only within the different cultures, but also within cultures. And I think of your book, uh, Mask Off, where you also used examples of non-Western cultural traditions to expose masculinity mm -hmm. as a performance. And um, I think it can definitely help to be open to different lifestyles um, in different cultures and within the cultural context. So what can we learn in your opinion if we widen our scope and just be open to, to a more diverse um, definition of what we want to be and what we can be? I think one of the things, one of the beautiful things about love is that it's such an amazing tapestry a mosaic, a constellation of different experiences, um, different beliefs, uh, different viewpoints and perspectives. And the way that we come together, like each relationship is its own unique kind of footprint. You know, it's its own unique snowflake or, or a fingerprint. You know, there's no two relationships that are exactly the same. And so, you know, sometimes you hear couples talking about their relationships and some couples are like, oh, we speak every day. You know, we, we talk all the time. And some, some couples are like, oh, we sleep in different rooms. That really works well for us. You know, we live in different places and, and they've been together 20, 30 years. There's some couples who have sex regularly, every day, once a week. There's some couples who haven't had sex in 10 years, but they are still incredibly happy and fulfilled. And I think having those ideas about how different relationships work should actually inform us and allow us to expand our minds about there being different ways of coming into a relationship. So if some people find the arranged marriage route is preferable for them and it works for them and their personality and their culture and their viewpoints, then they should be free to do that. If some people want to, you know, sleep um, with their partner on the first night and they want to get into a relationship that way, like that should also, also be something that's comfortable and accepted for them. As long as it's two consenting adults, as long as mutual uh, consenting adults and they're, you know, working together and they have that love, then that should be fine. And I think there are so many different ways that we really have to expand our minds and do what's comfortable for us. And I think that that will actually improve- My advice. The quality of relationships we oh. get into. Yeah. Please, Dr. Ruth. Go ahead. Yeah. Go yeah. ahead, Dr. Ruth. Yeah. Okay, first of all, my advice, please don't forget contraceptives. If you sleep with each other the first night, like you suggest, make sure that you are using a contraceptive because you do not want to have a pregnancy before you know that this is a person that you really want to share your life with. I don't want unintended pregnancies to rise again. So people have to be not only sexually literate, they also have to know about how to prevent unintended pregnancies. And then if, if, if an adult, uh, if two adults want to have sex, the first, and I, the first time they meet, that's perfectly all right, but make sure you are protected. Um, uh, either condom or maybe she's on the contraceptive pill or an IUD or, or whatever it is. So that the um, that, that uh, uh, sexual act doesn't result into something that you do not want for the rest of your life. So I'm a little old fashioned I would like people to get to know each other a little better than first night stands. But I'm also not naive not to know that first night stands do happen. Exactly. I wish, I wish them well, but they have to be protected and sexually literate. 
Dr. Ruth, actually, there is a question from the audience to you about this sexual literacy. So if we want to strengthen sex education in schools, how can that happen? Okay. The first thing, thank you for that question. The first thing that's important, sex education must be taught in schools. However, there have to be some preconditions. There has to be a seminar in the evenings with the teacher or the nurse or whoever is doing the sex education and the parents so that the parents know what material is being presented to their age appropriate uh, students in terms of all the ideas about sexuality so that the parents don't have to worry what is that teacher or nurse or a, a sex educator doing to my children and then after that seminar then the children uh, should be able to have a shoebox in the room and to put their questions into that shoebox like we're doing here tonight no names but children do have questions bring those questions to class put them in a box and then let the teacher or the nurse whoever it is uh, take those questions no names and discuss them uh, in detail. So we will have a population of sexually literate people growing up. Mm -hmm. JJ, I think um, from, judging from your book, it's not only sexual literacy, right? That you are, uh, that we need, uh, but you are also asking for a more conscious approach to actually what we mean by masculinity and by the gender roles, etc. How do you think can this happen to have this conversation? What do we need to lead it? I, I think it's also about really having, I, I mean, I completely agree with what Dr. Ruth was saying in terms of sexual literacy, um, but I think there also needs to be a, a level of emotional literacy and emotional intelligence as well in terms of the way that we form relationships, um, in terms of what we understand to be norms in relationships. Sometimes we internalize the mistreatment or some of the negative examples that we've seen in our lives, whether it's in our own, whether it's within our personal homes, whether it's the representation or misrepresentation in the media. You know, sometimes we, take that into our relationships and we think that it's normal you know we don't if you look at movies and romantic comedies and so forth they fill us up with a lot of preconceived notions of how people should act in relationships for example everyone says that it's normal for couples to fight or argue in a relationship and if you think about it that's a pretty toxic expectation to have and then you know, if we look at the way that children are raised, for example, if a, a lot of girls are told from a young age that if a boy is mean to you, that the boy likes you. So that's normalizing mistreatment. And then we carry those conditions, we carry that socialization through into our adult relationships, sometimes without even realizing it. So we really have to have the kind of level of reflection and emotional literacy to be understand, to be able to understand why we think and feel the way that we do about ourselves, why we think the way that we do and feel the way that we do about our partners and the people we relate in relationships with. Why is it that something may trigger us? Why is it that something, you know, that my partner has said has made me feel upset? It might not even be what they've said. It might be that it reminds me of a previous partner. It perhaps might be that it reminds me of a situation that I saw growing up and I'm seeing this traumatic experience replay out in so many ways, but we don't really have the language or the emotional literacy to understand that. And so I think having that self-reflection and self-awareness is incredibly important as well. I think you mentioned the role of culture, right? And of movies and books um, that play a big role, of course, in um, presenting traditional role models or very limited role models. 
they can of course also have a positive effect. Um, actually, there's one question from the audience, whether there are movies that we can recommend that show the um, love life or sexuality of older people. And I'm thinking of a movie by Andreas Dresen, a uh, German director, uh, Cloud Nine, Wolke Nine, uh, which I can really recommend. Uh, you should find it in the library of your local Goethe Institute. I think that's really a great way of also showing uh, the sexuality of older people. But maybe you have other suggestions. Dr. No, I, I want to underline what you just said, that movie is excellent because it breaks through a taboo as if older people don't have sexual feelings, as if they can't engage in sex anymore. And they have to be realistic. That movie is excellent to be realistic. He cannot hang from a chandelier anymore. And maybe it is better to have her take more initiative by a female superior position rather than the uh, traditional male superior position, position for, in order for him to be able to obtain and sustain that uh, erection. So that uh, movie is very much to be suggested. Thank you, Dr. Ruth. Uh, Sima, there is another question uh, from the audience as well. So what is compatibility? actually in relationships. I think that's pretty much the secret of your profession, I guess. Uh, I hope you can share it with us. How do you choose people that are compatible? Compatibility, uh, a pair, husband and wife, they are from the womb of the two different people. So they cannot be same. Two brothers cannot be same. Two sisters from the same mother they cannot be same. Their thoughts are different. Their views are different. Their thinking is different. What is compatibility? Compatibility, a husband and a wife, they are from the womb of a two other mothers. They are going to stay together and they have to adjust. Like if a hobby of a husband is different and a wife is different, or if a thought is different of a husband or a wife, they have to adjust. This is called compatibility. Like the same views cannot be the same between husband and wife. There has to be a difference because the own two sisters and two brothers also are not same. Then how can a husband and wife be same? So when they adjust and when they, I mean, I mean, when they stay together, they have to be compatible. They respect each other. That is the compatibility actually. That's the way I think. And then the life goes smoothly when they are compatible. Then the wavelength, they match their wavelength and be compatible. So this is the way of compatibility like. Because two people cannot be same. So they have to little adjust and little compromise. So this is the way of compatibility. Since we have to come to an end slowly of uh, this discussion, um, maybe one last question to all of you from my side. Um, looking at the now upcoming generations, uh, the younger generations. Um, Sima, maybe looking at your grandchildren then or grand-grandchildren that you might see in the future, what would you hope for them? What, what do you think is important um, for their love, uh, sexuality and relationships? Who are you asking? Sima first, maybe? If... Yeah. In uh, frankly, I have to tell that uh, our Indian culture is not so free. That's the way. We are not so free because the sex education also is not there in the schools and all. And in Indian, in Indians, we are not, not so free in discussing with the family, friends and with our relatives. So little it is compact, like we cannot openly discuss. So this is a tradition of India. So slowly now this thing is changing, but like in the Western countries and all, the thinking and the process is different, but sorry to tell in India, we are not so free. That's a clear opinion. Uh, Dr. Ruth, how do you feel about this? Yeah, I feel that as long as we say that respect is the most important part 
in the relationship that uh, people should be hopeful, that everybody should be hopeful that they can find a significant other in their lives in order not to be lonely. And I think that with discussions like this by the Weimar Institute, this is the most important message to take away this hopefulness and saying, I will find myself a partner and I'm going to learn to be the best lover in the world. And we have films, we have books, and we have people who have discussions so there is a lot of help available. So first of all, thank you for the Weimar Institute and the, the Goethe Institute uh, to do these discussions because I think it's very important. Thank you, Dr. Ruth and everyone for being with us. JJ, if you think um, of the younger generation, what is yeah, your hope for them? I'm very hopeful. Um, I think that they're a generation that's growing up they know what they want and they're thinking about the choices that they make and the only thing that I can really say is for younger people now and anyone really getting into a relationship is to be at peace with yourself and to bring peace into that relationship and vulnerability as well love is a matter of the heart you know and we know that sometimes the heart definitely supersedes the mind and what you feel the emotions can be one of the most powerful instincts. Love is one of the most powerful instincts, if not the most powerful instinct in the world. And so it's about bringing peace to ourselves, but also peace to each other. And I think that if we're able to think about that a bit more consciously when we move into relationships, you know, it will dramatically change the way we live, we live our lives. Thank you very much. I think throughout the two days of the Kultur Symposium now, we've heard of a lot of challenges that especially the young generation is facing. So I think with these advices for a happy or stable and conscious love and sex life, uh, they should be better prepared. Thank you very much for participating. Seema, Dr. Ruth, JJ. Thank you. Have a good evening. Thank you so thank much. You, thank you, thank you. Bravo to Zoom that we can do this. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.